Whether it was witchery, some modern science, or a demon let loose from hell, I am unable to decide. Williams Bell from an authenticated history of the Bell Witch. Who, who's there? From 1817 to 1821, an entity calling itself Kate tormented the Bell family of West Tennessee. There is still no widely accepted explanation for this haunting. Coming summer 2024 on the new hit audio drama Afflicted, the Bell Witch returns to haunt a family in 1960s Tennessee. But only if we raise enough money to pay our cast and crew a living wage. Help bring this haunting to life and snag exclusive rewards like limited edition supporter t-shirts, producer credits, and more at afflictedaudio.com slash support. But do it quickly. Some perks are limited only to early supporters. Staring at the Abyss. I'm your host, Richard Gerlach, and I found some strange stick figurines in the woods, and I don't know what to make of them. Uh, Matt, what do you think about these? Well, I saw these in uh, HP. No, it wasn't HP Lovecraft. It was Allard book, <laughs> and they looked pretty cool. <laughs> and Villa Bay, what about you? Uh, this I don't usually see these kind of things in my stick of the woods, so... Yeah, this is it's interesting. <laughs> We've also encountered a um, a strange, strange person, a Zachary Rosenberg. I care about anything to say about oh. these uh, about these sticks. Well, hello everyone. Um, yeah, I just think the I, I, you know, you see a bunch of stick figures. You can't help but go into a cabin and check out who's there. <laughs> Probably <laughs> my first reaction. <laughs> <Listen>. <laughs> A strange cabin yeah, in the woods, uh, but I'm going in. I mean, every horror <laughs> that I've ever read has told me that, like, whoever is in there is going to be friendly and helpful. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, the guy, well, he's today... back downstairs in the cellar. He was just probably helping to get up, so. <laughs> yeah, the poor dude, he, like, Let's... tripped and fell. Maybe he needed some help, <laughs> and, like, nobody's around, and this is the 40s. No one has cell phones. Yeah. Uh, he just... He he was a good Samaritan helping that dude out of the basement. Help mm-hmm. that dude out of the basement. <laughs> Total overreaction, in my opinion. <laughs> 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 well, today's episode of Into the Circuit of the Abyss, we are going to be discussing sticks by Carl Edward Wagner. And we also have a special guest, Zachary Rosenberg, author of The Long Shalom, which is coming out next month. And you also put out a Western recently. I'm blanking on the name of it, though. If no one minds the shameless plug, it is Hungers As Old As This Land. It is a Jewish LGBT horror Western. Yes. Love it. Perfect. (laughs) I need to read it. I really really like the premise of it. Oh, thank you so much. Um, Yeah, it... (laughs) Really began, and you know what? It's funny. It began as a short story itself, and uh, I sent it into the um, Brigades Gate Western call, and they got back to me with, "Hey, we think this should be uh, a novella." Oh, awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> that's just, always a good just, thing yeah. to hear. Just, just a little bit for our li- for our listeners. Could you tell us a little bit about the novella? Absolutely. Um, it is called, like I said, "Hungers and Oldest Land." It's set about uh, twenty about twenty years, give or take, after the Civil War ends. Um, in the territories of Montana, and there is a settlement that is a predominantly uh, Jewish settlement um, out in the mountains, and they live in the shadows of these mountains that are known as the Hungers. So this is prime land. Um, you have the bankers and the railroad companies, 
And one conglomerate wants them gone because it's easier to get the land rather than do business with them. So he hires a group of mercenaries to clear it out. And we have our heroines, who are two women who have grown up in Gray's Bluffs. There's Esther Foxman and Siobhan O'Clary. And they are a couple. They're doing their usual uh, rounds for the town. And the town ends up attacked, and they have to try to save it. And it all comes down to a showdown in the Hungers, which has which a reason this town is prosperous because of a pact with these creatures there. <laughs> yes. Ooh, so That's you are you you're almost like mixing a little bit of Lovecraftian horror into it. I wouldn't I wouldn't you know what I wouldn't necessarily call it Lovecraftian um, or cosmic. I try to be as unknowable as possible, but I think I I don't have that necessary. Um, uh, lack of understanding that I think is like so innate to cosmic horror. Mm. I just for me like anything that involves like making a deal with creatures, I'm like Lovecraftian. <laughs> <laughs> fair point, fair point. But yeah, this was really nice. I, I I I like the fact that there like there's been a rise in like Western horror. Yeah. Yeah, I'm 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 really happy to see that honestly. I mean, western horror has really been around for a long time and there is um just really so many good examples of it and I really think it's making a kind of a comeback it deserves. I mean, it's one of the most in my opinion it, it it's really extended all the way into literature. Um you know, I know horror can be like the red-headed stepchild, but like Blood Meridian is what I would consider like one of the greatest um, American novels, and it's um, I, I would say easily what someone could consider Western horror. Um, yeah, you know, <laughs> Lansda Joe Lansdale's been doing it for a while. Um, you have stuff like, uh, you know, Cornet McCarthy also wrote No Country for Old Men. Um, you have mm -hmm. stuff that takes the Western, um, you know, the usual Western tropes and adapts yeah. it to anything like horror and fantasy. But it's like. Um, it's really making more of a comeback, like kind of just embracing the Western as a whole. And I know Villamay, you did, you wrote a great story for that anthology. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we, I'm continuing like with a trilogy based on that story. <laughs> I love to hear that. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, it's, it's also too like Western horror has been uh, around, like you said, a long time. Like Stephen King, The Dark Towers, and seven book weird mm -hmm. Western horror fantasy series. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I was just thinking that. Like, you know what's, what's interesting, though? And I could be completely wrong, but it's funny that it hasn't gone to the movies recently, like, much. But maybe no. there are movie references, and maybe it, somebody can enlighten me on that. But, like, because I agree, it's like, I, I love seeing this boom. Oh, wait, what'd you say? There was one with Kurt Russell. Yeah, Tr yeah. True Bones Grit, Tomahawk. True Grit. And well, yeah, but uh, would you consider that a horror Western or just a Western? This is a western, that, but I, it's but it's a good yeah. western. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was I think that was Jeff Bridges. That yeah. was oh Jeff yeah, Bridges. that's true. Yeah, that's true. But the Kurt well, Russell Kurt one you're talking Kurt about. Was, yeah, that's Bone Tomahawk. Probably, Bone Tomahawk. Yeah. Oh yeah, Bone Tomahawk. Um, probably probably the best horror western I've seen honestly is uh, Ravenous with Guy Pearce and Robert Carlyle, which is just a brilliant movie. Yeah. Oh yeah, and I remember that one. Damn, that was a good it's one. So it's. But, like Robert Carlyle, he's like a really good gem. People need to watch, like put him in more movies because he's such a good actor. So good. He, the, you know, it's much more. It's so impressive in that movie when you learn they improved almost everything. Yes. <laughs> like the, the, the writer went home. The, the the writer literally like went home early into it because I'm, I'm not I'm not sure why, but it was like they were filming in like the cold and the snow and it was super uncomfortable. So the actors were really just left to just you know figure out their own motivations and do their own scenes and choreograph it all, and like they, it should not work, but it does. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. The writer's like, "Peace, I'm out. I'm not dealing with this. I oh, did not nice. sign up for snow and cold. <laughs> <laughs> I might have put it and in my yeah, story, was... but like, really, I don't want to be with it." And yeah, there, 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 there's just been like, you know, like the, I, I love Westerns because you can blend like so much genre with them. Like, you know, um, I, I really think the Westerns like owe a real debt to like the old samurai films. Like, you know, when mm -hmm. they were doing uh, for a fistful of dollars, like I think, you know, Akira Kurosawa actually sued them for ripping off Yojimbo a little. Yep. Yeah. So there's like uh, so much. Or yeah, it's a fistful of dollars he sued them for. 
Which I mean, yeah, and Ujibo. it's Yojibo to a false. <laughs> like, I mean, it, it, it totally is. Like, you know, I, I think Yojimbo like paid a debt to like that Dashiell Hammett's Red Harvest too. But yeah, um, th- there was like a lot of those you know tropes that just influenced every. Uh, uh, you know, um, I think Toshiro Mifune was actually in a movie. He was actually in a western with um, Elaine Delon, and oh, yes, I, I think it was Charles. Charles Brunson, I think it was like Red Sun or Rising Sun in the West or some, something like that. Huh. It's a sheer of a was great. Like, that guy never gets the credit he deserves as an actor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. He was he was so fucking good. <laughs> yeah, and I watched like, the Seven films. Samurai once a year. <laughs> oh, Seven Samurai. I'm, I, you know what? I, I really do love The Magnificent Seven just because of Eli Wallach. Like, he's just so... And you'll... Eli Wallach, Yul Brenner. It's, it's, it's just, it, it, I mean, it's a really good remake, even though Seven Samurai, in my opinion, is like a much superior film. But like, I, I would love to see something like a, uh, like a, you know, like a samurai horror Western. That would, I, I don't think like, you know, we, we have enough of those. I would love to see something like that. <laughs> hold my tea, hold my tea, Zach. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I actually, I actually, ha- I have a, I ha- there's an idea in my head that I, I have almost outlined. So it's similar to what you're describing. Ooh. Please and, and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's been like, a, like, you know, like, um, horror westerns, you know, like, like good horror western films. There's like so. You know, like every so often they pop up in like unconventional ways. Like other ones, I would consider like uh, Near Dark is really good. Um, mm-hmm. Dead birds, yeah. Dead birds is fun. Uh, the Burrowers. There, there, there was one called Ghost Town, which is like a creepy ghost move. Which is like a creepy ghost uh, western that's really really good. Was that the cover with the skeleton cowboy? <laughs> I think so. I, I think, think so. so. It's like into like this past, like, like this town being held hostage by a ghostly outlaw, it's uh, it's pretty fun. Um, you know, like there was also one called Ghost Stands, which is like the first uh, slasher film to like actually use fully indigenous characters and in folklore. Um, you know, I, I I haven't seen it in like twenty years, so I can't say how well it did it. Like, you know, it's a little like, attempt to say like this did like indigenous stuff well. It's like you know. Especially because you know, hard does not really have like, a track record with that all the time. Yeah, but but yeah, that that's one I think is also a, a western. And um, you had I, I, like one of the old there. There's there was one with Charlie with Chuck Bronson called like White Buffalo, where like there's a rampage like demonic buffalo that they're trying to put down. Yes, that sounds super familiar. That, yeah, I'm, I'm, like, I'm like just racking my brain for like all, for all of these. Like there, there was one that was a real influence on Hunger for me. It's like it's it's not well known. It's, it's called the Burrowers from like 2008. Where like well, the premise good... is, yeah, it's like the the premise is the um you know the settlers have been killing all the buffalo, so you have these creatures who are known to the tribes there who used to prey on the buffalo, but without the buffalo, they're going after people. Ah, yes. That so, sounds cool. <clears throat> yeah, and it is a, it's a surprisingly um, creepy monster with a really freaky M.O., honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, like, it, it, takes, it takes a lot to, like, really, you know, like, freak me out in a way. But, like, the burrowers, like, they will inject you with a venom that, like, keeps you paralyzed and fully aware and then they will just leave you until you start rotting and then they'll eat you while you're still alive oh my god <laughs> hey hey <laughs> so say unfortunately the story we're discussing this week isn't a weird western but <laughs> it is a fantastic <laughs> horror story it is one of the best one of the absolute best um you know, we lost Carl Edward Wagner way too early. Um, you know, he did stuff from horror stories to, um, you know, swords and sorcery. He's got uh, the Kane series, which is really a, uh, like, you take Conan and you make it much, much darker than you have Kane. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Styx is considered his masterpiece, and I, I think rightly so. I think it's a uh, one of the best examples of cosmic horror and Lovecraftian fiction. And it really kind of blows me away how the story is so, how do I put this? 
unorthodox in its structure. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like, there is a whole thing about, you know, the whole thing. He finds a cab in the woods. There's something in the basement. Um, this, this could be the entire story for someone else. But when it comes to car- when it comes to sticks, um, that's really the only beginning. Um, he gets away from what's in the basement. Um, he's haunted by it, and like then it proceeds, and it kind of, you know, there, there's there's like a period of you're wondering of what the heck is going on. Like uh, you know, he's back to being a comic artist. He's you know influenced by the stuff. Like you know, where and then like the ending, like you know, without spoiling, it just kind of hits you over the head. That just makes it so much better on a reread. Yeah. Well. well- you know, totally. Like, I've read Sticks about three, four times, and we'll dive into it deeper after we talk about media for a bit. But every yeah. time I read Sticks, I find something new to appreciate about the story. And I'm happy that Valencourt has got the rights to reprint one of his collections because it's been a pain to get his stuff. In the Lonely Place is such a good collection. Um, and let me just also shout out Valencourt are freaking heroes. They yeah. are like something no one like no one else or few others are and it's such a necessary incredible thing you know i think they were doing the whole the, the preservation line before grady hendrix uh entered the mix but like he has been incredible on this like that man's got like an encyclopedia worth of knowledge yeah and i i don't know like you know how they've been doing it but it's been incredible the stuff they've been putting back into print um they're in a lonely place i i read that collection it is a really really good collection there's like some the variety the creepy stories um i think there's there was one called um it's like these it, it's a great one like a man learns that like there's a conspiracy among doctors to like you know withhold uh cures for diseases so they'll they'll never um run out of relevance yes that was a great one that one's a great one in that collection I, there's one with um it's like monkeys or rats hiding in the like weeds and where that the one's summer like, ends. Oh, that one is just <laughs> freaking creepy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I was just like, I remember reading it and just being like, where is this going? Cause it's like a neat concept of people find, you know, buying old furniture and there's like this creepy old, like resale place and rich i know we'll, we'll let's we'll get to media stuff in here in just a second um yeah but you know yeah so you're just kind of following it the owner's like this weird guy of the house but then like it gets to that point where you're like oh no there's like little monster things running around <laughs> and just like killing people <laughs> and this is insane and it's all weeds and it, which is funny like when i read it like it I know right now we're in a huge like mushroom horror boom and, and, and that kind of thing. But there was a little period of time where there it was just like, like right before the mushroom stuff, it was all like just nature horror. I was seeing a lot right of it. Back, there was, co- what, what'd you say? Back to the killer weeds. <laughs> yeah. And so like, it, it's just interesting with that. And then like reading this and knowing it came out like 30, 40 years ago, you're just like, man, <laughs> this was crazy. Well, one thing I do want to say about Valencourt, too, is, like, the preservation is great, but it's really just horror. It's, like, they have a whole LGBTQ line where they're just reprinting old, like, gay and lesbian fiction. Um, they also have been doing lots of international reprint, like, printing. Like, they've been getting, like, a lot of books that had never been printed in English before and getting English rights to translate and, and print them out over here. It's been really cool just to see like what they've built as a company. Yeah, yeah, what one hundred percent? It's it's I'm um, I'm absolutely loving it to see like everything Valencourt puts out. Then they they put out stuff that's like you know really really should never be for should never have be for, been forgotten. Yeah, but before we dive fully into sticks, we do like to give a little rundown of some media we can speak. And surprisingly, I don't have that much to uh, talk about. I'll avoid anime corner, but <laughs> that being said, an anime corner, all I'm going to say is Demon Slayer. You just said. <laughs> Demon Slayer is great. Hell's Paradise is great. Stopping it there. Um, okay. <laughs> I, have, I have fallen into a succession hole where I'm trying to binge all of succession leading up to the finale. Oh, did and you know there are two iconic actors that are playing in it? Which two? 
Uh, one was Ingvar E. Sigurdsson. I don't remember in which season he came in. And the other one just, in, I think it's, it's in this season. His name is Johannes Hugur. I'll keep an eye on it. I'm, I'm on the end of season two right now. But this show is fucking great. Like, I love it. It's, it's, I thought I would hate it because it doesn't sound like a back cup of tea. But I've been having a blast with Succession. It's pretty much, it feels like one of those prestige HBO shows where, like, if you think of HBO, you think of The Sopranos and The Wire and those, like, kind of prestige dramas. And Succession kind of feels like in the same crowd as those. But it's just, it follows this family, the uh, Roy family. And the patriarch is a Scottish man named Logan Roy who grew up in Dundee, Scotland, as a working class boy. And he has transformed himself into the head of a multimedia company who's pretty much like picture Rupert Murdoch meets Walt Disney. And you have Logan Roy. (laughs) Uh, It's quite the mix. Yes. He he owns a multimedia company that has a whole animation music part wing. And he also, the other part of it is extreme right wing news. Um, so he's, he's a bit of both. And the first episode, he has a stroke and he recovers from the stroke, but after the stroke, the whole, everything in the air is his health is on the decline. He doesn't have a successor to replace him. Which one of his three children is going to be his successor? Okay. And he has, a. uh, Kendall, his oldest son, or I'm sorry, his second oldest son. Kendall is uh, a recovering drug addict and on the spectrum. And he wants to be like his father so much that he's doing everything not the right way or not really understanding what he's doing. He's put by Jeremy Strong and Jeremy Strong is fucking fantastic. But for me, the, the best character of the show is Roman. His younger brother, Roman's played by Kieran Culkin. Nice. And he is just a fucking idiot. <laughs> and I love his character so much. He's so fucking stupid. And then I the like daughter, that. Shiv, or uh, Siobhan. Uh, Siobhan is kind of a ruthless cutthroat. And she will do whatever it takes to kind of end up on top. And all three of the siblings have this like love-hate relationship with each other. Where at the end of the day, they're family, but they're also trying to compete with each other to get in this chair. And you never know, like, what's really going to happen in the show. Like, I have my predictions, and I don't think any of the three children are going to become the successor. Because the show kind of paints itself as a Shakespearean kind of comedy. So I'm like, if it's a, if it's a Shakespearean comedy drama, none of these kids are going to get the role. It's going to go to somebody else. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> but that being said, the show's a lot of fun. It is very funny. And I've been having a really great time just like watching this, watching the show. And that's been my week. I've just been watching Succession and my work has been absolute chaos. So I haven't had that much free time this week. <laughs> but Matt, what about you? Yeah. So I read Preston Fassel's, uh Landis. The story of a real man on 42nd Street. Uh, um, so basically what this is, this um, Bill Landis, for people who don't know, and I didn't know until I read this. Back in the 80s in New York, well, I knew about this part. All the grindhouse cinemas and porno cinemas in Times Square, you know, people could just throw movies out there real quick and all this stuff. Well, Bill Landis created the Sleazoid Express, which was a mag- like kind of a newsletter um, early version of like a zine. He kind of really kicked off the zine scene. Uh, <laughs> but so it, reviewing these things and just like, you know, kind of covering what that world, that little tiny world of Times Square at that time, what that was. And he kind of when he started out, he was doing a, it was a little bit more Gonzo esque, you know, a little bit more Hunter S. Thompson, where he was writing himself kind of into these reviews and these slices of life about the place. Eventually, he kind of got out of that. But kind of what the story really is, is just he really fell into this like kind of dark 
world and kind of self brought on slash his life time, like growing up and everything like that was not great. So he like, he would get really attached to people and he would get offended by like anyone who didn't completely agree with him. And he would do these like crazy prank phone calls and sending like satanic letters to these people who some of them are literally were his friends at the time and people he worked with, but he like, if he didn't agree with them or they didn't do exactly what he kind of thought they were going to be doing, he would just like bombard them with these crazy things So he it's just this interesting story about him doing that. And then eventually he like he does porn for a little bit. And it's just he and they talk about that in the book. But then he finally kind of hits a point where he's on so many drugs and doing so many different things that like he almost dies and has like a real come to life moment and gets married and kind of cleans himself up and does much like Times Square cleaned itself up. So like he kind of follows that trajectory and eventually he kind of falls back off of that wagon in a really hard way. And which was sad because you get through this story and you get through what Preston is telling us is like, he was getting up like really popular. He was getting stuff in Fangoria. He was getting stuff in, in all these like popular huge magazines he was hosting events and doing like just these award ceremonies and everything so like he had a really big chance but then it just he blew it all and kind of just went really dark again and it was just really sad um what's fascinating and what preston really had to do with this is really dig deep because there wasn't a lot of information about him a lot of people who were still alive that could talk about him didn't want to talk ill about the dead. And so it's just, and his magazine kind of Sleazoid Express just like disappeared, you know, because again, it was just literally copy from a printer, like a copy printer at his office. (laughs) It's like he would steal work hours and print all these things out. So like Preston had to do a lot of digging and uh, right during COVID a lot, uh, a number of, kind of famous grindhousey directors passed away and all these other old timers were like, well, crap, we need to tell our story. And so Preston was able to get the story about Bill or yeah, about Bill Landis through all of this. So it's just, you know, it's really fascinating, interesting kind of look at what that world was like at the time and what this person went through and what he did. And it, it's, it's really cool. It's really good. You can really feel Preston really felt for this guy. I don't think he ever met him, but he just was really fascinated by him. And in fact, even Preston tells a little story about like kind of at the beginning, how he heard about this person and how this kind of hooked with him and, and his process. Like he was writing, Preston was writing an article, I think for daily grindhouse about Landis. And anyway, it's a really fascinating book, and I think it's Encyclopedia Apocalyptica that press put this out, and I, I'm i looking at it right now because I can't – yeah, so it, it's out. It's available, and I highly recommend it just, just to find out about somebody in this time and what that was like, and it – it's super good. It read really fast and it, and it does make you want to know more about it and kind of look into all of these things. So Landis was great. Uh, the only other thing, which surprisingly, and I think we could have a discussion about this when we talk about sticks is I finally, after years of everybody else watching it, I finally saw the first season of true detective and how he did. Yeah. And I finished it. I can't remember if I, I, I don't think I didn't talk about it last week, because we were talking about King, but um, I did finish it right around that time too. And, and geez, that was a great first season. It just, the acting Woody Harrelson and Matthew McConaughey were absolutely brilliant in this. And I, you know, I don't need to go into details about the story. You know, it's, they find a body and then it kind of time jumps back and forth. It's just, really dark and disturbing and um, a ton of what I picked up of Ligotti stuff. In fact, I think I even did a little searching and there was a lot of ties to conspiracy against the human race from Thomas Ligotti, a lot of Matthew McConaughey's character saying those things. 
But what's interesting, like, is as you see this progression through time, you kind of realize, like, he, Matthew McConaughey, kind of loses some of that feeling and kind of change. It doesn't completely change his tune, but especially the final, the last episode, you can kind of see him change on what he's thought, what he was thinking. But yeah, it's, I, you, I just loved it. I, there's a fact. There's a what? There's, a, there's another Icelander who plays in Two Detective Season One. Oh, really? Who? Ola Batari. And Do you know who he was in the show? He's the big-ass guy they interrogated. Oh! <laughs> oh, okay, okay. The, the huge man. Yes. Oh, yes, wow. Yes, he, he, he played the guy. Yeah, Ola Batari played him. And he's a, he's a huge teddy bear, though. He's really <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And another fun fact: season three of uh, True Detective actually happens. Uh, well, it was shot here in Iceland. Oh, all right. Yeah. Well, I'm on it's board. Set, it's set to be in Alaska, but then you look at the house and you're like, nah, that's Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and, and like Jodie Foster works here like for weeks, and I'm like, buy a house, stay here. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be great. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been so cool. <laughs> but I can't yeah, wait for the new you know what? I said I can't wait for the new season. Yes, no, it's gonna be awesome. I yeah, I I, I was really hooked. Looking forward to that. Yeah, I think it'll be cool. I we I, I started the second season, but Rich, I think you had mentioned and other people had mentioned that it's, it's not as good and and like it it's <laughs> this joke. Cause it's Justin Lin directing and I, I don't know if he directs all of those season two episodes, but after watching a lot of fast and furious movies with him directing and then watching this, you can see <laughs> he, he really likes the, the glance where all the characters just stare at each other for a moment with these funny looks. And, and like, <laughs> that's like, I think the end of the first episode of season two, it's like a minute of them all, like the camera shooting back and forth between all of them looking at each other. And you're like, Okay, dude. <laughs> we don't need that. Dear God. <laughs> but season anyway, season three I'll... is better than season two. Okay, good. And yeah, I, I'll bring it up when we actually talk about sticks. But uh, rereading sticks yesterday after watching season one of True Detective, I was like, okay, like I can see some uh, references possibly in here with this. I mean, not completely, but. Definitely all the stick things in the first season of True Detective and the cabin in the woods and all this stuff. <laughs> there, there, there were some semblances there. But I think oh, that's it for me. Uh, Vitlame, what about you? <laughs> I, I was productive. Yay. When it comes to, <laughs> yeah. when it comes to consuming media. <laughs> Should have been writing, but what the hell? Hey, you know. Hey, you writing, know what? Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, Perno oh, sucks. Um, so yeah, I, I did, I did finish, um, from the last time I was on the podcast, I was talking about, uh, Scott Moses, uh, are you, our own unique affliction? Yeah, I yeah. finished, I, I finished it and I enjoyed it. Uh, there were a couple of places where I didn't expect it to go. I felt like the prose was a little bit too cold, but Giving when when I read the acknowledgments and uh, and of course what Scott has been going through when he was writing this novella, I completely understand why the throws so, like felt a little bit cold. It just it was uh, the best description I can probably give this book is basically like this is the amusings of grief through an immortal being. Oh. <laughs> So it's like, like it's that. it's like existential. I can't say that word in English. I don't know why existentialism. Well, probably not not the correct one. Uh, <laughs> basically, basically, just you know, she's ta- at least talking about what it is to be alive and what it is to be immortal and should she die or should she not and just going through the emotions. And it's a it's okay. an interesting yeah, and it's an interesting concept of you know using because. You would always consider that when you were a vampire. Like, would you, would you embrace immortality, or would you bemoan it? Yeah. So this, like, the, the, it's basically this kind of question that rolls around throughout the entire novella. 
And there were there were a lot of interesting concepts there, there were a lot of interesting characters, but unfortunately they didn't go that far. Like I they they it wasn't ex- they weren't explored as much as I would have wanted. Like they were really interesting concept with like the Wranglers, who were basically people who uh, like humans who were, were like shipping the vampires to and fro uh, different kinds of cities, like in their uh, shipping containers, <laughs> like it through their trucks, which makes sense. I mean, how else would they travel around? Yeah. And then there was also a concept about these. Uh, they, uh, Scott calls them thralls, which is like uh, a fam- like a, almost like a familiar, but like they were more and more like this one person was like more or less insane after maybe <laughs> I think consuming the blood, like the vampire blood. So that was also an interesting concept, but it kind of got shot down really quickly. And I'm like, I wanted answers. <laughs> <laughs> It's like I can't. I don't leave me in the dark here. Yeah. And I, I need a little bit more. So I feel like he probably could have explored this into a like a full blown novel. But maybe his like his state of mind didn't really allow for it at the time, and I totally get that. You should just do whatever you can to do when you're writing in when you're feeling depressed. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was it was still enjoyable. I did enjoy it, and I I wouldn't I would not not re- recommend it to people. And I also finished Caroline Kepner's the latest you. <laughs> and and eh, meh. <laughs> the third I'm loving book, it the, when you first talked about. The, it. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I was loving it, but like now, like as I continued listening on, it it dragged a little bit, and um, I don't know. It felt like to me, like Joe was really just losing his touch. He was just more of the whiny person than in his in the rest in the other books. Like to me, the best one is the third one. The third one's so good. Yeah, the third one is really good, and it just really displays. Just the character of Joe. And I feel like the first fourth book does not do that. He's more whiny. He's just more whining about elitists and how like he's the best fucking writer in the world and the others are the worst and stuff. And you're like, eh, you guys. <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm like, you definitely did not have a beta reader, man, or even an alpha reader. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, hey, Joe, you, know, you would have an MFA, you can't write, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and it's like he uh, he could not get at like receive any criticism, then he would just blow up. And I'm like, oh, you're not in it for the correct occupation, then. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, it just it felt like the ending. I'm not gonna spoil the ending, but the ending felt a bit bland to me, it just didn't have that huge crescendo that you get like you got when you were reading the fir- the third book because the third book you were like oh shit how the how are you gonna scramp your way out of this one joe <laughs> uh, and then <laughs> then in this one it was like eh, i i i managed it it's fine and you're like but the why <laughs> and 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 how and just why you're just so nonchalant about it oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I, I was I was a bit disappointed. I did. Well, I mean, I think his name is San Santori. No, Santorino. No, the guy who narrates um, the the, the U books, Fontana. I think his last name is Fontana. Oh, I actually have no idea, huh? No, it doesn't. Uh, well, it doesn't matter. The guy who narrates uh, <laughs> the U books, he's phenomenal. And I really hope that he, like, if Caroline is going to continue with the book, see that he continues narrating them because he is the perfect the, Joe. The narrator is said, you know, Fontana. There we go. Oh. I did. I had Fontana ride. <laughs> He's a big Broadway person. Okay. I know who really? you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, that explains a lot. His voice yeah. is so funny. Also, he's a, like, a crazy ex-girlfriend. So there you go. For real? <laughs> yeah. Shit, I need to watch Crazy Ass Girlfriend again. I, I think oh, I, yeah. I think I stopped at season two because well, you I definitely think, saw him. 
he was in, he's in season one. He's the guy. He's the <laughs> people are like, what the hell are you talking about? He's 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 not the I can't think of the guy that she moves to California for, but she's the other guy or he's the other one. Um, no. Yeah. Oh At least I'm pretty God. positive that's him. I could be absolutely oh wrong. Oh my God, but. that would be that be amazing. Oh my God, that guy, that guy's so talented. <laughs> yes, yes, that's the dude. So yeah, okay. Like I mean, Fontana is an amazing narrator, and yeah, I just really hope that if she's gonna produce more of you of Joe's book, like the books about Joe, that he will still continue narrating them because just listening to him is a joy, even though I fucking hate the character Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I also finished, well, I'm, I'm about like 30 minutes left. I started uh, Cassandra Coff's uh, The Salt Grows Heavy. Oh, nice. How was it? It's it's a short novella. It's about like two and a half hours, like okay. through Audible. And uh, it's, I would describe it like a dark fantasy horror. It's really interesting. Like her prose is really, it's flowery, I've heard. And um no surprise, it has it has a lot of flowery prose in this, but it's really beautifully written, and like she managed to like kind of transform like the gory scenes into this kind of like lyrical prose, and it doesn't it doesn't really like when I'm like when I was listening to it, I wasn't grossed out by the description by the like gory descriptions. I'm like, oh, this is actually pretty pretty nice. <laughs> it's pretty. <laughs> And it's about like it's about this um they they like the humans call her a mermaid, but she like to her she's like a completely different like um deep sea creature, and she's like on a journey with the plague doctor, cool. and they are just going around like traveling around this um like the 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 country is not i think described. But it feels to me like this is like um, she's grabbing onto a lot of uh, different fairy tales. Uh, like she did, she does mention like um, the, you know she said the Cinder Princess, and I'm like, ah, oh, that's Cinderella. And then she talked about like uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Like she, she like casually mentions them as her, like as the story goes along. So feels like it's supposed to be within this, uh, like within like a fairy tale setting. And um, and they and then they like get st- stuck in the woods and they find like a basically a cult of children and like I got a huge ass like Lord of the uh, Fly wipes from it <laughs> and uh, they are worshiping like this three three men who are I think army surgeons and I think there's a fairy tale about these uh, about these uh, army surgeons. <laughs> And like, and from there, like the story kind of unravels and it like goes into really horror, gory territory. And yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see how it's going to end. So you said she's, so she's not a mermaid, but she's like a mermaid. I mean, right. Yeah. Like they, like she said, like in how is she, how it's written in the story is like the humans called her a mermaid but like then because it's it's uh, written through the point of view of the of this creature like she's like nah i'm i'm so i i mean you probably don't have a word for what i am but you just saw you just saw my half body and my and my uh, scales and you're like thought hey mermaid <laughs> so d- does <laughs> she can she live out of water yeah she can okay okay and, so and how, she does ha- she walk and, yeah, mm, that's the thing. I d- I don't think she walks. She's like she's carried around on a horse, okay. and then she just kind of paddles like a seal. I think if she's put on the ground. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I was just like picturing like having to push like a water tank through. Everything. Yeah. No. 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 She like she had been like captured in the beginning of the story. She had been captured by a king or prince. And then um, the prince fed her her own tongue. Nice. To make her not like speak or something like that. And by take, it's kind of like a cell key situation. Like if she stay, if something is taken out from something taken from her, she kind of has the ability to walk on, like to be on land. It's like Little and, Mermaid. 
Almost, yeah. Like I think okay. she's I think she's getting that inspiration at least from that. <laughs> But yes. then, but then, as the story grows, uh, as the as the story continues, you you see that the transformation is as he's stro- slowly transforming back into the creature that she was. Okay. And like she eats everything. <laughs> <laughs> but so she has like a fish tail. Yeah, I think so. But it's not really. It's not. It's not the. Sh- that often it's more like she has scales like she has translucent skin she has like this uh, angular teeth mm. and like huge huge eyes like they almost look alien and like cool. uh, and kind of like almost like translucent hair okay I dig that so, All right. yeah like when you when you get that description of course you get like this is a deep sea creature like what the fuck yeah yeah <laughs> Like I was, I was expecting bioluminescence at that point, but she didn't go that far. <laughs> she just shoots out ink. <laughs> mm, I don't. Yeah. May, no? Maybe she did. I well, yeah. Sometimes <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Sometimes I, I, I didn't pay much, enough attention, but yeah, I I do like it, and I like the 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 plague doctor. The plague doctor is really nice. That's cool. Um, and then I finished two movies yesterday. Ooh. Uh, I decided to watch Quantumania. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> eh. Eh. Yeah. Uh, it's, Quantumania I feels like a Fantastic Four story that they just copied and pasted Ant Man in, and then everything just didn't really work. I know it just felt really rushed. They could have like really they they I mean they could have put this in two movies or they could have put this in a like a mini series. Because, like, the world, the quantum realm is, like, so huge. They couldn't, they didn't even have enough time to explain how all of this happened. And you're just sitting there, like, why is this happening? And, you know, Scott is almost asking the same question. And people are like, oh, oh, just just go with the flow. Yeah. And I hated the fact (laughs) that, like, how everything was dealt with. Uh... Like at the end, when he just suddenly back in town, and I'm like, "Wait, how the fuck did you get back home?" <laughs> they just completely skipped that part. I'm like, "Wait, did the ha- how was she able to do this so fucking fast?" <laughs> and because because what really pissed me off is they had they had never shown Cassie to have any kind of scientific mind before. Mm-hmm. And then, and then all of a sudden, like she's like, "Oh, I just hang out with Hank all the time, and and I know everything now." And I'm like, "No, like you're not Tony, you're not Tony Stark, and you're yeah. not Hank." Yeah. For me, for me, hey, actually, for me, I was really happy that Hank was there. Like Michael, uh, what was his name again? Michael Douglas. Douglas. Michael, yeah, Michael Douglas. I'm really happy that he's like still playing Hank because I love him as Hank. Yeah. He's so funny, with without the intention of being funny. <laughs> and I also love the fact that they suddenly allowed them to say "holy shit" in the movie and a dick, but they could they didn't they didn't allow Scott to say "son of a bitch." Yeah, <laughs> it's like it's like basically they had two swear words like, and that's the limit. This is a Disney Pretty movie. Pretty much that. It's that. <laughs> And yeah. uh, and um, I, I did like I did I did like the Modoc uh, thing. Yeah, <laughs> that that was actually that that was actually hilarious. So insane. Um, but yeah, it's just one thing. Also, that really, really like got on my nerves was the fact that when she was like delivering the message, and I'm like, did you rip this off of Andor? <laughs> yeah. Oh, and totally. I, and, and then I like looked at my husband like this was much better in Antor. I mean, I'm not feeling any fucking patronism here or something. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 can you imagine like she's like broadcasting this to all the people in the quantum realm? A lot of people are like, who the fuck is this girl? Right. Why do I have to listen to this person? Yeah. It's like, why? <laughs> why do I know you? No. Know? Like, what are you doing here? Like, at <laughs> least in Antor, people recognize Ma- M- Mavis. Yeah. Like they knew who she was and what, like, and what she would she'd been doing the entire time. So of course, people felt felt inspired by her words. Exactly. None of that would have like. Why did they put it there? I'm like, this is so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
was really let down, to be honest, because I really enjoy the Ant Man movies. Yeah, <laughs> but I kind of, but it kind of just kind of showed that Paul Rudd was getting a little tired. Yeah, I, I, I did not, I did not enjoy Quantum Mania. <laughs> yeah, I had, I, did, I had a very negative reception of Quantum Mania. Besides, um, what's his face, the actor who played Kong the Conqueror, who's probably going to be getting recasted now. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. That's um, the positive thing I had to say about that movie. Yeah, um, I I don't have much positive thing to say about that. I'm like, also, if you're going to introduce your kick-ass new Marvel villain who is a threat to the multiverse, maybe mm-hmm. don't have him lose to freaking Ant Man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. It, yeah. When, especially so, especially after his like declaration that he has killed all of the Avengers before, and I'm like, and you you can't kill this guy. You can't stomp on an ant. <laughs> yeah. Well, especially I don't know if any of you seen the new Guardians of the Galaxy, but the high evolutionary it when you see, and i've seen this like online people talking about it like he would have been a better overarching villain because he's so menacing and so, like just people awesome. are saying yeah yeah i've heard i've heard that that he's, he's like, like so the second best villain evil. yeah so pure I mean, evil yeah yeah i've heard he's that like, people are saying like he's yeah, the second best the villain to thanos yeah, yeah. Which is yeah, so I was feeling a little bit let down by that movie, but I was still like in a, like a Marvel kick, and I just I just realized like, hey, I haven't I haven't watched Black Widow yet. <laughs> and I, I, mean, I, I'm, and I I'm, I'm gonna say, oh sorry sorry sorry, Emily, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, it's okay. And do you wish you still haven't seen the Vint LeMay? No, I love that movie. Really? Yes, this movie was amazing. I, I loved Mar I loved Guardians of the Galaxy. Um I thought, you know, Chukwudi Chukwudi Awuji was fantastic as the high evolutionary. Like that is when you just take a villain, you decide, fuck subtlety, I'm going balls to the wall, which is pure evil on this, and it just works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, totally. I yeah. He they just I and you know, like it, it, a lot of people were talking about it, and, and we'll get to Black Widow because I saw that too. But the uh, people were you know, he, he, they show a lot. And I actually think James Gunn is, did something cool there by showing like, I mean, like he didn't go into full like surgery view, but like enough where you're like, this dude is just pure evil. <laughs> and like, Oh yeah. They could, he could have like set his, like if you were going to make him your overarching villain, as opposed to Kang, which I agree, why have him lose to one person or like in a bunch of ants? And you're like, wait, this is our big bad. But the guy from Guardians High Evolutionary, it's like you could have easily set up his overarching goal of I need to remake the universe because I don't think it's the way it should be. And he even has like a quote about being like, well, God left and I stepped in. It's like this is your big bad that you could have mm-hmm. all your other people come up and try to stop because his goal is different a little enough different. I Like, I guess with Kang, his goal is different than Thanos where high evolutionary, you could argue is like, well, it's the same concept of I'm trying to make the world a better place. At least with the original idea for Kang. <laughs> 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 True. <laughs> uh, evolutionary, I'm just saying. <laughs> Fair. Like his 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 this, his, this, this his, is not a subtle like I, I, I love how like I love how like in so many Marvel things, you know, um you will have like these interviews where they're just like, oh yeah, my character doesn't see himself as the villain. He thinks he's doing like, oh yeah, my character lost his family and like, you know, stuff that like it may or may not bear any like relation to what actually happens on screen. The high evolutionary, they're like, no, this guy is pure fucking evil. He's just a yeah. total piece of shit. He needs to fucking die. Yeah. hundred <laughs> <laughs> like, percent. Like Chuck Wooji is just like, uh, he's like, oh, Oh yeah, no. He's like, oh yeah, no. I, I just went completely freaking evil, and I just had a lot of fun doing it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's I mean, so true. And I'm just like, yeah. I'm just like, yeah. Let's. let's I mean, th- 
look, we all love layered villains and complex bad guys. Sometimes it's just fun and cathartic to see just someone who's just pure fucking evil. Yeah. Right? Sometimes you just need a no nuanced bad guy. Yeah. But so, Miller, I, how do you feel about Black Widow? To get back on back on task. <laughs> yes. I really liked it. I don't. I really don't get all the backlash to it. Like to me, yeah, it doesn't really feel like a Marvel movie. It feels just like a like a standard like spy thriller movie. But I don't care because I love the characters. The intro of the movie is one of the best I've seen. Like uh, from the so... from. Sorry. Oh, I was just kidding. You go on. I was just. Kidding. It, it's. It was very hard to watch, but go on. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, it was really hard, but it's like, it also speaks like the truth of like, sometimes like, like human trafficking. This is like a glimpse into that. Yes. Yeah. And I just really love that they added like these kind of human like notions or like real reality notions into this because yeah, this happens. People like, especially little girls are kidnapped and they're sold to people. And... uh, I don't know. Like, yeah, like the characters are really good. I love Florence Pugh. Like she's my one of my girl crushes now. She's so talented, <laughs> and she's so, and she's so she's so good as Elena. Yeah. And just and uh, Rachel Weisz is also really good as a Russian. But my yeah. favorite, but my favorite was David Harbour because he just fucking loved being this Red Guardian guy. <laughs> Yes. He and was he great. He loved Honestly. he loved every minute of being that guy. It was so funny and so enjoyable to watch him. I'll watch David Harbour in anything. Like if you throw David Harbour in something, Same. I'm there. <laughs> he was yeah, David Harbour's fantastic. He was great in uh, A Walk Among the Tombstones. That's like the most yes. evil I've ever seen him. I honestly even yeah, he was great in Walk Among the Tombstones. I also thought now the movie itself isn't good, but I really liked his portrayal of Hellboy. Oh yeah. Oh no, I haven't seen <clears throat> yeah. that one. I haven't. Yes. Seen, I haven't seen that one yet. So yeah. I thought, I thought he did a really great, more comics accurate uh, version of Hellboy. Than it the is Marvel. not a good movie. Good job. It's not, it's not a good movie. The movie's terrible. It is a terrible movie. But <laughs> David Harbour is having a blast in it. I just love the fact that he's choosing movies that he can have fun with. Yeah. And this one was a lot of fun. I just, I, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Like the, the action scenes, the, the story about, because I, I, I love this fact about like what you should, what, if you, if you can like control free will, what are you going to do with it? And yeah. this, and this concept about, you know, they're spies, but then they're just, they're actually being forced into being spies. They have no free will. I love that concept yeah. because, because this is like kind of like, a twist on the fact that they are sleeper agents, but they're like forced sleeper agents. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I just I really like this movie, and I don't know why people why it got such a backlash. I actually Maybe it's, the movie. I just heard lots of bad things about it. Yeah, I like I heard a lot of bad things about it too, and I'm like, I, how? And then I watched it, and I'm like, what's wrong with you? Is it because it's a female driven? movie or or is it because it's black widow and it's like none of the other ventures come forth like <laughs> not none of them come which is nice I, I, and i don't like i'm not sure i haven't read all the backlash the only thing i can think of and again this is just me guessing is that the way like how it came out and I think it confused like general public people to realize like, oh wait, they might have made this movie before Endgame and Infinity War, but it came out after. Yeah, I think so, that I, that might have been that. I, I, I think do. It I might do just agree. confused them all. Yeah, I mean, I do. Th- I totally agree with the fact that they should have released it before Infinity War. Like definitely, because there isn't there is an end credit scene, and I haven't I haven't watched. Um, uh, Hawkeye series, but um, there is an end credit scene in the movie that kind of shows what's like the aftermath of Endgame. Yeah. And yeah. And yeah, like I think they, I think that at uh, that credit scene basically was shoehorned in, maybe. Oh, a hundred percent. They yeah. needed to tie it to this later stuff, and, and yeah, like, yeah. 
So, but but um, the thing that's the thing though, because not a lot of people, like, you know, stick around for the end credits. So they, they yeah. yeah. Well, before we hop over to Zach, I did remember I did see a movie this week that'll make Matt very happy. <laughs> oh gosh, I saw Fast Ten, baby. Oh my! Oh gosh. yes, oh, boy. all about family. So good. The, those oh, movies boy. make no <laughs> sense, and I love them so much. I'm I'm still trying to understand how this evolution from street racing to like. Uh, how how this happened like the only thing i can figure is vin diesel's character is like this eldritch cosmic horror that is assimilating everything it encounters <laughs> into family like there is no more hobbs there is only family <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 fir- the first fast and furious movie is actually a good movie like the first fast and furious movies point break with street racing and I'm, like i'm just the- sitting here like it seems like every villain like starts like trying to kill like you know all the heroes and their children. And then the next movie they're like showing up to the cookout with like Coors Light. Yeah, <laughs> the best is, is the villain of Fast Nine, John Cena's character Jacob, who's surprise Vin Diesel's character's brother. Um, yeah, <laughs> in this movie he shows back up, and it's the same character, but he's just acting completely different. <laughs> like, oh no, I didn't just try to murder you and your family in the last movie. I'm helping you guys out now. We're all buddies. I was like, what? <laughs> uh, so I I give I can answer all of these questions. <laughs> One, Fast Five, I think, came out right when all the Marvel stuff was getting big. And I think Justin Lin actually directed Fast Five. And he they did. both were like, okay, we see what Marvel's going to be doing, and we can do it better. Because all the movies from five on are better versions of Marvel movies. <laughs> the John <laughs> C. <laughs> I John C. Fast Five is so good. Right. And that's the start of when it gets super amazing. The John Cena answer is they watched Peacemaker and they're like, oh, wait, John Cena is a really funny person. Let's make let's <laughs> make him funny. Because you watch Fast Nine, it's like they they had to have squashed him. Um to answer this cosmic question, God version, there is a scene, and I like my weird, twisted, like horror brain and like meta loving person. There's a scene in Fast Nine where Roman, Tyrese's character, is commenting on the fact that they've been in all these crazy things. They're like, we fought a tank, we fought a giant sub, we've done all these things, and none of us are dead. And, and, and he's like, you know what this means? And everyone's looking. And in, in the theater, I'm sitting there going, say you're in a movie. Say you're in a movie. Say you're in a movie. And they go, <laughs> no, we're, we're superheroes or something like that. And I'm like, no, have the writer of this movie comment on the fact that these characters know their action stars in an action movie that can't die. And, and do that. Have like some crazy. I mean, like, how amazing would that be after? nine ten movies to just go a huge 180 and be like oh no these are all fake people and they they're realizing they're fake and fast 10 is them trying to break out of the scene (laughs) and break out of the camera to be real people i was like oh that would have been so awesome i will (laughs) say blown all movie watchers fan like brain fast 10 had some amazing set pieces yes (laughs) Like the bo- the bomb in Rome, fantastic. Yeah, and Jason Momoa is eating that movie up. Like he's having a blast <laughs> in that movie. Um, but that being said, it is another fast movie. I think it was better than Nine. I thought Nine was a bit too much for me. Yeah, um, I think this is probably the best fast movie since like Fast Six. Yeah, I would it's- agree. But um, that being said, it's still ridiculous. It's still over the top. It's still how the fuck are they doing these movies? It's just a big Vin Diesel ego, ego stroke. Oh, yeah, definitely. And of course, it's a cliffhanger because this isn't the end of the Fast movies. Hey, don't spoil anything. There's going to oh. be more. At least okay. one, two more. Okay, okay. Uh, you need you guys if you since you like this movie so much, you need to go. You need to f- go on TikTok and find a guy. I can't remember the. I probably. I, I think I have it saved. I'll send it to you. There's a guy who decided to ask his followers what the next movies are gonna be named, 
And the results are hilarious. <laughs> that is a good question. Fast X Part 2? No. <laughs> Fast and the Furious, it got even 11 won. Or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> like like the, the the examples were so funny. And I wouldn't be surprised if one of the exec producers is watching this and taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we dive into this thing, Zach, what about you for media this last week? All right. What have I been watching? Um, well, I've been going through a bunch of books and horror stories. I just finished um Daniel Krause's Whale Fall, which is a masterpiece. Oh wow. Um it is a fant- it is a genuinely fantastic book, and I absolutely loved it. It, 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 like honestly it's so much more than the sum of its parts like um how can you get like a book out of a guy stuck in a whale for uh you know like it, it, it's not a very long book but oh my god the emotion the writing it's just incredible wait wait um, wait 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 sack you said it's not a long book but i've seen it looks like a tome like how many pages is that whale fall uh let, let me let me check that out real quick whale fall page count i wonder if um, it's so bad i heard it's so good I think it's like 300 pages. Okay, well, I thought it was a lot longer than that. that that's doable for me. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the, um, I, I, re- I kind of rewatched these with a friend, but um, John Wick 4, which I really enjoyed. I had a very good time yes. with that movie. And, I, and I'm like, nope, we are definitely getting a five. I'm, this is not the end. We got to take down the high table. I'm just in for it. It is just turn your brain off, have a great time and enjoy. Um, and also the Dungeons and Dragons movie, which I uh, absolutely adored. It's so good. I so love that movie. Fun. It's so, so much. good. And I am so upset that it did not like do billions of dollars at the box office. And we're not getting like a whole franchise on this now. Because They're not? this movie. Well, th- we might get a sequel, but it will probably be a lesser budget because the movie did not do well financially in theaters. Um, Are you kidding me? It's a oh, I'm so I think I, I, I think it's making better numbers on streaming, I hope. And it got oh, yeah. really good critical reviews, but it's just like it's a movie with so much heart and so much humor and a yes. great cast, and I just had so much fun with it. Um, and it's I also such a good like, introduction to Dungeons and Dragons. It totally is. It is just, it it really is a fantastic film, and I am just like so happy with it. <clears throat> and I also rewatched uh, Halloween Ends, which I hate. <laughs> <laughs> I am like, I am just like I. Look, I know tastes vary, and I don't begrudge anyone for what they enjoy, but I am seeing people post about how it's a masterpiece and how it's... I'm like, did we watch the same movie? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, look, I, look I, I, this would make an okay standalone, but, like, they're talking about Michael Myers. Like, he's some dark urban legend or some metaphor for, like, gentrification as opposed to a six foot four man who butchered half the town just a couple years ago. I'm like, no, I don't think I don't think you get over like, you know, half the town being left as corpses and the guy who did it still being at large. And then it's like and then it's like and then like, you know, um Jamie Lee Curtis has become like a YOLO hippie. And I'm like, well, I'm glad like a year Therapy has done for her what 30 years without a dead daughter could accomplish. <laughs> 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 and then, like, okay, and I'm sorry, I know people like Corey Cunningham, but like, oh, he is shunned by the town because they have an excellent reason to believe he murdered a child. Why do I feel bad for this again? <laughs> and then, like, <laughs> My fa- my my favorite character in this film though is Corey's stepdad. Like his one role is to like pop up whenever Corey's mom abuses him and just be like like in like a really solemn voice, like, yeah, I believe in you. Go get a short. <laughs> I hope you find love. Like I'm like, who wrote this dialogue? <laughs> <laughs> Can I say like, the best okay. part the, the best part about that movie though? Best part. When Corey snaps and he remembers Michael Myers is living in a sewer, which why the fuck has Michael Myers been in a fucking sewer for two fucking years? And no one, never mind. But he goes back to the sewer and jumps Michael Myers just to take his mask and leaves. <laughs> I know. I am just like, okay, I'm sorry. The chances that I could take, like, you know, 
like Michael and Corey apparently do like the Sith rule of two thing together, and like you know, <laughs> uh, and you know, like Michael apparently is overthrown by his apprentice, except not really. And then, uh, like, look, I'm sorry, but this is a way to ensure your villain has no more credibility. It's like, like Michael is just. I'm like, yeah. The problem is, it's uh, it's like nobody doubted Michael was a man. It's just that he's like a six foot five, very strong, very fast man who's very good at killing things. <laughs> and then, like, Halloween Hills decides, like, okay, Michael is actually a supernatural force of dark evil that is growing stronger with each person he kills. Halloween ends. Oh no, just kidding. No, he's not. <laughs> oh my God. It's like a very tonally inconsistent series at best. <laughs> so yeah, I absolutely like. There is just one thing I really enjoyed about it um, until the ending. Um, but like the journey getting there, it's like I'm just sitting there, like, why did you go all in on Corey Cunningham? <laughs> oh, that's so. I crazy. mean, like, I, you know, I, 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 I don't want to sound like the guy who's just like, oh, I'm upset that I just didn't try something new. Um, I actually really like when franchises mix it up a little. I this, this just the problem with taking risks though is sometimes they fall flat, and this fell flat. Um. Besides that, um, I do want to shout out a horror story I just read recently. It is uh, by John Langan, uh, Technicolor, which, since we will be talking about like some cosmic horror here for a sec, um, it is a fantastic example of cosmic horror. It is just a brilliant story, um, just unbelievably good and scary and is with an ending that hits you with a gut punch. It's on Pseudopod, so anyone can just listen to it for free, and I think the narration actually improves it. Um, yeah, th this is honestly one for the ages, in my opinion. Awesome. Did that just come out? Um, no, it's been out for a bit. Um, the Pseudopod episode has had it for a while. I'm actually listening through like um, their archives right now. So, um, But yeah, it is, it is really, really good. Nice. I'm Perfect. always down. Yeah, John Link is one of the best. Yeah. No, he's incredible but um yes anyways um let's talk sticks let's yeah talk sticks. yeah so we matt and i had discussed the story a long time ago with michael patrick hicks back when mike was on the podcast um, yeah. which was years ago but this is always a fun story to revisit like i remember when i first heard about sticks i was listening to the horror show of brian Keane. you know back when that was a thing and mm -hmm. they're talking about the story and I, I, it took me a week to track down the story, and I found it in the shitty he, – he's an asshole, but the editor, Stephen Jones, the British dude, he does the mammoth yes. book of short stories things. He has the mammoth book of zombie stories, and Styx is in that. And I bought that, and that's how I got to read Styx. And then you were like, wait, this isn't really zombies. Yeah. I mean, it's a lich, but – whatever yeah um and this story blew my socks off when i first read it like it was just so fucking good but it's it's so good it's like you know like, like i said it's what would be an entire harsh story and carla wagner is like no fuck you this is my intro motherfucker <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i mean that's like we talk about his this collection is like that all the way through all of his stories. He just really does his own thing and it works so well. Yeah. I didn't read the whole collection, but I've only it's, read it's two of good. his short stories. It was this one. And I read, we had Colin, Colin Bunn back on this podcast a while ago. And he has a short story that takes place during the civil war. It loves cannibals and zombies. And it was so much fun. I forget the name of it right now. But I had to track down another anthology just to read that fucking story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and we talked about it with Valencourt, I think, you know, and we will get into the story. But I do agree. I think it's nice that that they are taking some of these more hidden things, maybe not hidden, but out of print things and bringing them back. Because it is when this came out, I did get it. I think I pre-ordered it and just like devoured it when it came in November, I think like it just came out, but like, it's just, it, he is what he does is so great. And what he inspires later on and everything like that. And even, I think it's fascinating with this story, you know, it, 
he, each of these short stories have kind of a, a afterward per story or like it's almost his notes on the story but it comes right after story which i appreciate for anyone who's a long time listener you know i'm terrible at reading the story notes at the end of the book of a collection because i just don't pay attention to that but when you're right after story it's nice and he makes a joke slash comment about how he's referencing different um like obviously he's referencing hp lovecraft but other other authors and it's kind of fun to see him being like oh these are people i read here's the pulp people i read and i wanted to riff off of that and do my own thing with what they've done um i I think that's just it's nice it's nice to see that um anyway to get into this actual story like real quick if you haven't read it we start right before world war ii with leverett and i can't remember his first name off the top of my head um and he he got drafted. He's out fishing kind of right before this to go to World War II. And he's enjoying his last time. And he comes across all these weird stick lattices, lattice things, which are described very like. And I think I had talked about this before, but uh, it the description of these things are very interesting. Like, And I keep trying to like picture what they are what they look like because at some point they're attached to boards and sometimes they're not sometimes they're sticking out of walls and or stumps and stuff like that and sometimes they aren't so like what do you any of you picture these things looking like um like the Blair Witch things but exactly exactly yeah, I kind of pictured that, and also like how you do a lattice on a pie. Okay. Just with sticks, and it kind of attached when it, when, to a board. Yeah, and then it kind of feels gross when you think about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it <laughs> it'll feel like wet and soggy and just like gnarly, and you're like, no. I think you think of the I, witch's hand that grabs the guy once he's in the basement. I'm sure that felt <laughs> very moist. Like probably the moist. Moist. I kind of I, I kind of love that. Like, you know, it, like a skeleton just like being creepy and moist and but like <laughs> you know, like honestly, I kind of like how Wagner like, like keeps it like a little like, ambiguous, like, you know, what do you imagine these patterns are? Like I really do like the kind of the Blair Witch feel it has. Yeah. Um, or I could say the Blair Witch project has a sticks feel rather. But yeah. um like just yeah. the idea of you know like these bizarre patterns and like it's the fact that they're sticks that um you don't you don't have an, a a real solid uh, foundation of what created these. It's like you know they're they're made by people, but by who and for what purpose? Yes. 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 And that yeah. I also... so, go on. Oh, you you go, Matt. I'm sorry. Well, I was just gonna get us further into the story, but like if you had something on there, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna do the same thing. Like I just love how even when like. He goes to the war. He comes back. He just can't get these sticks out of his head. Yeah. And like he like, even before yeah. that, which I really liked, is he he's following this trail of these lattice figures. And he ends up finding this cabin, which we talked about, that's covered in more of these things. And of course, it, he goes in because there's a strange cabin there. And. It's like just the way he describes this cabin and the inside, the house is just completely empty and the walls are covered with basically like blueprints for what these sticks are supposed to look like. And it's all charcoal and or cut into the wall. And as a say normal person would do, he sees a basement. So he goes down into this basement because, again, you're (laughs) you're already in a cabin in the woods by yourself. Why not go further? And then that's where he finds like this this thing on this table that like th- he does a great job of sort of describing it, but sort of not leaving it in the shadows, much like our character sees it in the shadows. But he ends that section perfectly where he's like, th- like the last line is hearing it come up the steps and then it cuts to 25 years later. <laughs> yeah, where he's fought in World War Two and now he's back and. He's trying to get his old artist jobs back, and everyone's like, oh, hey, you're back. Sweet. Yeah. Here's all oh, this work for you. <laughs> Your stuff is really creepy now. <laughs> yeah, but it was like, wait, these faces are way too bloated and disgusting. Please fix this. 
<laughs> this is too intense for our readers. Please, please make adjustments. Yeah. What are these stick Latisses that you put together? They're so yeah. fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, it's so amazing that he's like working at pulp magazines and doing all these things. Um, but again, well, listeners, because, because um, when, it, when this whole was going, when the, all this was happening, I have a copy of Worst Things Waiting by Manly Wade Wellman. With Lee Coy Brown's artwork in it, and I just picture all the stick Latisses from Lee Coy Brown's artwork. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's covers and stuff. That's amazing. I'm just gonna note the greatest thing about Manly Wade Wellman is he totally looks like a guy who would be named Manly Wade Wellman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> I really do love um, you know, like yeah, well Wellman stories are great. I love the backwoods stuff. And that's like a reason I like sticks, because it like it goes from backwoods horror to cosmic horror. And honestly, like one thing I do want to shout out that I don't think is very um like you know, I know it's been talked about, but like I think um this is really an example of the Lovecraftian horror done like really, really right. Cause so much of that really depends like, oh, here's a random monster. But no, Six really gets into the head of this of these people and the way these experiences, like even the subtle ones, not just seeing like a giant monster, but just seeing something slightly unnatural can stick in your head for so long and how there's so much more out there. It's such a disturbing and creepy, uh, creepy thing. Yeah. Well, and like he does, like, I like that. And, and, and because of what he does in this story is, it's like a combo of those things. It's the the uh, tie-in to like kind of his little people, like Carl Eder Wagner, I mean, like his people. So he's calling off all of his all the writers and stuff he likes, which was sort of like that Lovecraftian idea, like of him as a person, kind of commenting on other people. Um, but also, what I think is even bigger to go with that is the way he leaves so much sort of hidden, because this is like a first person. Right, it's first person. Or am I wrong? Am I looking at it, this? It's no, it's uh, third person. No, it's third person. But yeah. anyway, that's good. Yeah, it's third person, and he. But what he's like, our camera is focused on this artist. But like, even like what the artist is doing throughout stuff, there's certain things that he's doing that we're not seeing, which is that big Lovecraft thing of the unknowable and the unseeable, and not keeping up like keeping things kind of hidden on top of like the monsters and everything like that. So like, we're getting like random scenes where he's like, Oh, I woke up and it's one sentence of, I was fiddling with sticks this morning or something like that. And then it goes to something else and you're like, wait, what? <laughs> like he's, he's making these stick things now. And, or like you get like this mysterious, like author that like, his 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 nephew <laughs> like appears but his nephew is like really weird like wearing dark sunglasses and is all in black and 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 just like all these little things that like you can kind of see what him taking that cosmic horror of unknowable and this bigger thing happening and like he just puts it enough to the side that we're not like because you could very easily take this story and focus it solely on the cult here's what this cult is doing here's what their plan is but instead we're like just seeing tiny bits and until the very end you realize what the books the publishing of the books and sending them out what that's doing and i just i thought that was such a cool like idea to do in this story i also really like the fact that in the story you are kind of reading it like like i said in the third person but you don't really get that deep into Leverett's head. Just you just get a little small glimpses, and he doesn't and he doesn't even talk. Like there yeah. are no there's no dialogue for him until right at the end when there's huge yep. tension when the climax has arrived. Then you get his voice, and you can hear the panic, the fear in his voice. Yeah, I thought I that, just, I, like I, that. I just I just really like that. It was, it was interesting because I was like, he's, is he mute? Yeah. <laughs> why, why, is he, why is he talking? Yeah. Uh, and I also like the fact, like, okay, this is my first Wagner story. So how, when was this written? 1970s something, right? Oh, that's like a great that. question. I think, it, I think it was 1974. Yeah. yeah this, this was definitely in the 70s. Yeah. 
I don't I don't get that vibe at all. For me, when I was reading it, I got like I was reading from an author who was who had lived in the uh, same year as Poe. Yeah. It's in the, honestly, like the story feels timeless. Like it, it feels like it could really have been written any time. But yeah, like it, how it, how it's written, it just it gave me like how Lovecraft and how Poe wrote at the time. It's like yeah. Yeah, the the eloquence is there, and especially you see it, especially when with the letter writing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because that's like yeah. that's kind of yeah. like the kind of derives away from the timeless thing. Because who who the fuck writes letters right nowadays? Yeah. <laughs> well, but, and I like. Yeah, but but how they how they wrote the letters is really eloquent. It's really beautifully prosed, and you you like at that time, like in the nineteen twenty, like nineteen oh one, so even like before at the beginning of the twentieth century, they put a lot of fucking heart into write, writing letters. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and it's cool too the way he uses those and uh, talking like it just the idea of we get a sort of a main character, the Scotty Prescott, who got him to do these art the artwork for these Allard books. And the fact that we find out one of these characters is dead through a letter and like you don't it's just Mm -hmm. i love that it's so off screen and like even for the even for um our main character he doesn't he like he didn't even know that he was dead and again kind of goes to that timeless time of like not knowing the like these things aren't instantaneously posted everywhere and talked about and called it's just as he finds out through a letter and you're just so like holy crap what is happening there's such a big thing happening behind the behind this story that you're just it keeps you hooked into this bigger thing and thinking about all of it. I really like the subtle hints in that, like when the guy has, I think his name was Professor Strupfoy, he revealed the death of Scotty. And yeah. I love I love the subtle hints as like, oh, like the, the police has never seen anything like this, but they 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 do suspect that it might have been people on high on drugs because of the yeah. brutality yeah. of it. And I'm like, uh, he was killed by a lich. <laughs> 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 and I just immediately in my point. head, my even though it wasn't described at all, my head went like, okay, he was torn to pieces or something. Like my head immediately went to yeah. all the glorious things you could imagine. His heart was devoured, which which comes into play later. Yeah. <laughs> much, much, much. Gotta love a heart, a good good old heart. But that didn't happen to well that wasn't oh. described to Scotty. It was that was what happened to Stuckroy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I can I can imagine probably happened to Scotty as well. So yeah. Yeah. It it really is just really uh, well done. Like, you know, you know the, the best part is you know what's happening, but not too much. Yeah, yeah. Every, all all the violence and the, like the horror part, it all happens kind of off screen until it needs to be shown to us as the reader. And at that point, it just provides a perfect gut punch. One hundred percent. Fuck. <laughs> I do really, I do really enjoy these kind of stories where you, as the reader, are helpless in trying to help the person in the story, because you are given all the things that is happening. But the character has no idea what's happening. Yep. And I, I really like that because, you know, it's one of those stories where you are kind of basically screaming at the pages. <laughs> it's like it's like almost like watching like a slash movie and you're like screaming, don't go upstairs. Yeah. <laughs> I do think don't it's interesting. Like, door. how did so, and like I like I like I kind of know, but like. How did this Allard nephew get hooked up with our main character? As in, like, was he following all the pulp magazines and seeing these drawings? Like, how did he know about that this guy was drawing the sticks? I think, I think my, well, my theory is that because the the leech was, like, after him when he was, walk, like, running up the steps, my theory is he's probably left a paper from his notebook. Oh. Yeah. 
and I that like and that and that yeah i think he like left some kind of clues like he's an artist he's right he's like doing this kind of thing and maybe the lich like try to follow in that direction interesting yeah it, it uh, you know the, the thing i really like is there's so much you can uncut it's such a straightforward story in a certain way until it like really pulls the wool over your eyes and wow yeah like you know everything seems so straightforward everything seems so direct and then like you know everything comes together though nothing in the story is really wasted everything you know has a purpose and a point and that ends up working so well yep yeah yeah even like that's it like the bringing that up all the everything kind of ties into it is that his uh frying pan his iron fire frying pan <laughs> like at such it was like a small little thing like you get the beginning oh he attached it because he's thinking he's gonna cook some of the fish he catches and then he whacks the lich creature in the head with it which is what you would do you would find the heaviest thing you have to knock this monster out but it's only till like literally the last page that you realize oh because of the iron he had stopped this huge year long or however long pentagram thing yeah. from coming together you're like holy crap everything everything has a everything plays in everything has a point everything like you know it all makes like oh like that's what happened oh my god mm -hmm. all the oh you know, <laughs> and it is a lovecraft story it is a lovecraftian mythos story so you know there's so much more going into the surface and so much more that you can't even uh <laughs> yeah. you can't even understand yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good point that you're mentioning about the the cast iron skillet because it's in because he mentions it you know at the beginning of the story that he you know was just going out the stream to catch some trout and just to fry it on the uh, on this on the skillet for lunch and you know as a, like a common reader you just you don't think anything further than that you're like okay that's a handy thing to do i guess yeah. uh, spe especially in the 1940s um, <laughs> And then suddenly you realize, like, oh, you you can use it as a weapon. That's great. And then later on, and like at the very end of the story, it's like, oh, you actually almost spat a, like a Lovecraftian apocalypse with it. Like, yeah. holy shit! <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. love that he like he used the mean like the things that you wouldn't consider, just things like throwaway things, basically that you put in a story that he, people would not think twice about and then suddenly like no this has a real fucking purpose y'all <laughs> yeah no it's i do i do love that i you know uh, like in a couple of things i was just like thinking about and i'll do it kind of reverse for what i was thinking in my head is i do love his commentary on the end like him coming back from world war ii I think that's really like a, an interesting little part. And I don't like every once in a while, this, the, it's not really a meme, but a thing will pop up on, on social media of like a picture of a guy right before world war two and then after and how aged he looks. And I think he did a really good job in this story showing and commenting on that. And uh, just this, like all of his friends, this main character's friends were like, man, you look different. You're really gaunt. And, and just really have that thousand yard stare and like even the commentary yes. about like his his drawings you know could be in one view you could be like oh well because he was haunted by a lich that like his drawings are like this but more likely it's because of everything he saw during the war and he's just capturing that realism and people don't want to see that so i really like that and that's like not anywhere near the focus of the story but it really like this third time through really stuck out for me is just this like couple paragraph kind of commentary on like what happens to people after being in a super long world war. Um, really sticks out to me too. Like, Cause I, I noticed that the screen through as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's really like the, 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 there's, there's so many layers to the story that I really enjoy. I, I, I really don't, I, I can't I really can't say, um, you know, too much good about it. It's just a fantastic horror story. Just one of the best I think out there. And like you know once you said there, there's so many layers like just the idea uh you know like world war ii happens you know the this time passes and it makes sense because like you know these ancient rituals aren't going to like happen overnight it's like all this matter yeah. of you know the, this just this, this click this quick disruption and then like it all um evens out to the end um 
if the, you know like um i'm drawing comparison but i would actually say like technicolor is actually like a really interesting sibling to like a not a sibling more like a cousin because it really draws on that like the ancient rituals the passage of time I'm listen the way to technicolor tonight <laughs> please do i really want to know what you think of it um like you know like there, there, there's really so much uh I'm really thinking of like ways they're alike because Technicolor, the way that it's done is through a, uh, co- it's like, it's set during a college lecture. It's not a conventional short story. It's like the professor is lecturing his class and he's, you know, doing little asides and he's explaining like the history of this mysterious old ritual and these. Oh know, shoot, wait, wait, is Technicolor the Edgar, the Edgar Allan Poe story when like he's going yes. over? That story is yes. fucking incredible. Oh my God. Okay. It's I know what you're talking amazing. about. It's amazing, and it really reminds me of Sticks in really the best way. Like that, I think they're like two of my favorite horror stories. Dude, there's a moment in that story. Oh my god, we gotta do an abyss on this episode. Out of the story, <laughs> <laughs> I, my, I look, didn't realize that was a story, but there's a moment. There's a moment in that story that like is so fucking horrifying. Oh my god! 100. Please oh, have so me back. To talk about that. Please have me back. Please have me back to talk about that story because I will rave about it. <laughs> Perfect. So, we got so one. Good. Oh my god. You know, it's funny you bring up the timeless thing, uh, and even John Langan. If like I had just recently read the croning from Laird Baron, and you're absolutely right. That one has nothing to do with this, except for that idea of the ancient and long for like long term like situation where like you know, the croning, you're focused on this like 84 year old man, but then like you jump back to when he was younger and his wife was younger and you jump back hundreds of years, like just this, that uh, captures that like kind of eternity thought of like a, you know, an elder God where for us, you know, 30, 40 years or in this short story, 25 years is a very long time. But for, like you said, it's like for these people, it's a blink in the eye of like this, ritual you know it's gonna take some time you're not gonna get it done overnight well before, um, before we wrap up this i do want to have one question for you matt yes. have you ever read um the fisherman by john Lagan? oh yeah okay. oh and that's really just like that that, that ties world. so good to the croning but the fisherman's yeah. so good yeah um, the, i did the fisherman and the croning are just brilliant um I, I took a lot of inspiration from the croning for uh the long shalom honestly that was like uh oh, that, that I, was... I, I noticed a little bit of that in my read long shalom uh the long shalom is, is, is honestly you like long, long, the long shalom a lot man it's a really fun read i am putting it on my list because yeah i i adored the croning uh, um so i'm for anything like that follows that but i uh, so i know we're wrapping up but real quick i just kind of to look step past sticks i i did want to talk about i find it really interesting the comparisons to Blair Witch which project and like but for me like again rereading this and thinking about it and what I had brought up earlier is like I you there's a lot of other stuff it feels like this inspired too I mean like True Detective like I said feels very inspired by this even if they don't reference it and they're more referencing yes. other things but the idea of the sticks And like this cult that's doing something that we never really see them stop. And like this bringing of uh, the yellow King and everything like that. I would read it, rereading this. I was like, Oh man, like you, like it's not the same, but you got this general idea of something bigger happening off camera. But then also thinking about the end of this one with the idea of them printing this book and and having it in a thousand, you know, a bunch of people's eyes and everyone reading it. And that's how it's going to call it out. I just like I can't help but not think of In the Mouth of Madness and the idea of printing out that book and what that does. <laughs> and so so like that actually reminds me of is, um oh, fuck, what's what's his name? The um black metal, black metal horror book. David Peake. Yeah, David Peake, Corpse Mouth, Corpse Mouth by David Peake. When they yeah. record this album at the at the end of the book, and they distribute this this accursed album in the world, and just all these horrible, violent events start happening for the people listening to the music. Oh, yeah. So good. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. So it's just it's just interesting to see now, like we could ask everyone who's made those things that we're referencing if they reference, if they read this, but I I just think it's, 
again goes to how good this is written and how he was able to do something that people are still sort of pulling from. So anyway, I know we're wrapping up, but I just thought that was kind of cool. No, and I, I encourage everyone to watch True Detective season one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. It was yeah, it blew me away. But I will say I love I just love how the end of this is like, yeah, we have your cover, we have the book. This is going nationwide. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like, They're like, fuck. It, like it's too late. You can't stop this. You cannot stop this at all. Yes. And that that's just so perfectly Lovecraftian. There's nothing you can do. It's uh it's done. You you it's happening. Well, it's also by the end you realize he's been used as a pawn this entire book. Yeah. Yep. And that's and that, that's books. that's what makes it like that that is what um gets the scary. That, that that's what gets the scary. It's great. It's so good. But Zach, thank you so much for joining us. <clears throat> no, thank you guys. And like I said, uh I would love to come on to talk, talk to Technicolor. Like speaking of Gut punch horror ending. <laughs> <laughs> Tentacolor. Tentacolor is a fucking. That's, that's not a gut punch. That's like a mallet to the head of an ending. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for having me. This this was a blast. And Villamy, it's great to talk to you. Uh, you know, Rich, great to talk to you too. Matt, you know, I've seen you guys like all online for so long. So, you know, it's awesome yeah. to uh, talk to you, like putting voices, putting voices behind the, uh, the, the words. <laughs> right. Totally. I hope my vo- I hope my voice isn't as whiny as you thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Come on, you guys are awesome. Oh, thank you, but, uh, Zach. Where can Lucas get in touch with you? Um, I am still on Twitter as long as that lasts. Um, at Zach Rose Writer, Z A C H Rose Writer, and also on Instagram at, at Zach Rose uh, Zach Rose Thirty Two. All right, and Matt, what about you? Yeah, actually, real quick, before I uh, give my plug, I'm going to give another plug for Afflicted Season 2. We're still playing the ads. They're still collecting money for that. Um, Just I'm going to read a little different than what I did last week. But just to let you know, Season 2 of Afflicted will be set in the 1960s and focus on a family being tormented by an unseen entity. Folks from the area insist that the Bell Witch has returned almost 150 years after her original appearance, but is this Bell Witch a copy or something far more sinister? Um, If you listen to season two, you know that there's a book bound in human flesh that's responsible for a lot of disasters, and this is going to be a similar idea. There's no exception for that, and we just need to know who's wielding those powers. Um, Please help them out. Tony Ransom is amazing, and season one of Afflicted was really good. It's a full audio production, and they really need the money to help pay the actors, pay all the people who make the music and produce it and everything like that. And it's just, if you can give them some money, the ad I think has the website, but if you just look up Afflict It on uh, Patreon, Absolutely. you should find it. It's so worth it. Help them out. They are super cool people. And yeah, we're going to keep supporting them as much as we can here on the podcast until hopefully they make their money met. Uh, I will say that season two was going to be out a year from now because obviously they got to get the money to pay all these people to do it. So really help get that together. And um, yeah, it's super great. So check them out. They're also on Twitter. If you look up Afflicted or Tonya Robinson, Tonya Robinson. Uh, Ransom. I don't know why I keep saying random names. Tanya Ransom. You look her up. Tanya Ransom is amazing, and all the stuff she does is great, and I completely support Afflicted. Yes, thank you. Yeah, they're they're super great people. Uh, You know, Nightlight is an awesome podcast, too, that she produces, so definitely check that one out as well. We covered one of the stories on there back in February, and we loved it, so I just, we're, we're here. We're helping support her as much as we can, so listeners do your bit and help her out as well and help afflict it out as well uh you can find me on twitter at brandenburg dm and vit LeMay, what about you they can find me on twitter as long as it's still there we got things are getting a little bit fucked up right now uh but i'm still there uh, uh as vit LeMay s perfect and this is richard gerlock you can follow me on twitter at rudy53088 and be sure to give a visit follow with at it to staring And as always, keep staring.